All right, everybody. Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're so happy that you uh, decided to spend your morning with us. Um, welcome to Tips for Better Food Photography with Lisa Tricaski. This is part of the Columbia Pike Business Roundtable Program. For those of you who don't know who we are, CPRO, we are the Columbia Pike Revitalization Organization. We're a partnership of businesses, residents, property owners, and the Arlington County government. Uh, we have a mission to foster a vibrant, safe, connected, and diverse Columbia Pike community. CPRO exists to be the convening body representing the interests of all those who live, work, and visit Columbia Pike. So that's just basically an overview of who we are. So now that you know who we are, let's talk about Lisa. Lisa Cherkaski has been a professional food stylist and food writer for more than 30 years. She has worked with restaurants and stores such as California Tortilla, Giant Food, as well as national publications such as the Washington Post and National Geographic. I am personally a Washington Post subscriber and enjoy the food section with all of her wonderfully styled photos. Um, so please welcome our esteemed guest, Lisa Cherkaski. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much. I'm really, I'm, thanks for asking me. I'm really... Thanks for asking me. I love living in this area and I'm really happy that I can one tiny, maybe do one tiny thing that makes it better and help. And I love small business. So it's and you live uh, in what I'm neighborhood along? You live on the Pike, right? I live on South Six. So yeah, I live, I live, you know, really close to Glebe and the Pike. Alcova Heights? Alcova Heights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Between Glebe and uh, George Mason. Yeah. Right. I mean, a block and a half from Ruthie's. Yeah. We're so honored to have you be a part of the Pike community and to join us this morning. So welcome. I'm, it's great. I love it here. It's great. I mean, the people are fantastic. Yeah. I've been here a long, I lived, I mean, I've lived in my house 29 years, so, long time. So. All right. Well, well let's get to the next slide and get things cooking. Shall we, Amanda? All right. Okay, so Amanda, do you want me to just start talking or are you gonna- Let's start right, talking so talk. and I will follow along, right. yeah. Okay, so this is, um, do you want me to tell you where these are from or it doesn't matter, we don't care. This is from the Silver Diner. Um, and these, okay, so this says use natural light, which um, a really important thing that, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go with basics. When you're taking pictures of food, do not do it at night. Do not do it with overhead lights or fluorescent lights or any lights other than either window light or photography light if you have that capability. Uh, directional light is really important because as you can see on this, it's lighter on one side and darker on the other. And that gives the image, um, it gives it, what's the, well, the contrast gives it, makes it more three-dimensional and much more interesting. It makes the food come alive. So you don't want the white light to be like, flat. Um, also, I, saw, I find personally shooting stuff outside extremely difficult. I don't know if anybody else wants to speak to that, but I don't do well with Instagram photos for um, my for iPhone photos for Instagram outside. I think Amanda, you may know more about that, but I find it enormously difficult unless you're in the shade where the, if you do it in the shade, the light is really soft and pretty. It's not directional, but it's soft. Mm -hmm. So yes, always take your stuff. I mean, I think the it's basic if you take it to a window where it's not hard sunlight, you're bound to be much more successful than if you don't. And you can mess around with hard sunlight and shadows and things, but that takes experimentation and it takes a little bit more skill. It's fun, but it takes a little bit more time possibly. Um, what was I gonna say? Um, I guess that's all for now, but yeah, natural light, but like north, light from the north. Yeah, and get close to get close to the window. And then, oh, and the other thing is, when you have something to back up a little bit, if you're shooting something that's dark on one side and light on the other, or dark period, or dark and light, like say you have a steak and some mashed potatoes, put the steak near the window and the mashed potatoes away from the window because the steak is gonna need the light and the mashed potatoes, if they have too much light, they'll have no, they'll have no contours. They'll just be a white blob, you won't see it. The same with whipped cream. Anything white, keep it away from the light or it won't have any, it won't have, it won't have any contours or contrast and you won't be able to make out what it is. And you'll lose the pretty shapes and the, the hills and valleys and all that stuff, okay? The dark stuff, if you have a chocolate cake, turn it, put it in the light next to the window and rotate it till you see the side you really like and look at it, get down there and look at it and put the side you really like towards the light and the side that has anything you don't like, away from the light, like the dark side of the moon. So 
that okay this one you can see this is in a studio it's for the post but it's lit very directly from the left side as you can see and this one i think is effective because it's just in really close you can see every ingredient it's very simple um, I think the bread looks a little dry. It sat there quite a while because there were a lot of people involved, which can make things take forever. So there's that. But you can see that I've moist, mo moisture is really important. So you can see the tomatoes have been moistened. The bacon's been brushed with oil, which oil and water are your friends because that's what's in food. That's what makes it moist, water and oil. And this simple background means you just look at the food, which is what it's about. I mean, sometimes food shots are more about lifestyle or ambiance so you want to show this is a lovely place to be but often just seeing the food is all anybody needs to know and people loved these they love these close-in shots often the food when i see them looks horrible and people love the shots anyway because they're so close in it's all about the food and so i think that can be really effective i think you want to move on i could talk more i mean i could talk as long as you want about any one of these slides probably this was for um this is a magazine cover, but it's it's from a restaurant. Um, I can't remember. It might be Chaya. And so here's one where you can just see all the food. I and overhead is much much easier than any other angle. So when you are doing your food, I mean you want to mix it up. You don't want to do all overhead. You don't want to do all like 45 degree angle, and you don't want to do all right into the food. But when you are getting ready to take pictures of food, look at the food and think about what's going to show it off best. Like, do you want to see it right into it like the sandwich or do you want that sandwich obviously from overhead would not have worked. 45 degrees might have worked if the bread was important to you. And this one overhead is really effective because it's graphic. You can see everything. It's fun and bright and lively. You don't really know where that, what everything is, but it doesn't matter because I think this is super appetizing and just makes me want to like see, find out what it is, roll them up and eat them and so on. And you can play a lot from overhead because you don't have to think about how um, the items in the shot are interacting with one another, like back one thing behind another causing problems, you know, weird things with horizon lines or interacting glasses, or you've got meat in front of the potato and that you can't see the potato and so on. With this, you can see pretty much everything. So it can be very, very, very effective and you can have fun with it. So this definitely shows up the ingredients. Okay, this one, let's see, what does the message say? It says, create depth without distraction. Um, well, this one, okay, so this one, Amanda, I think is gonna talk about this because this one is nice because it's the drink, of course, the drink looks fresh because it has the bubbles. So, that was really important. And of course, I did that at the very last minute. Everything else was ready. Figured I made every, we made every single decision we could make before the drink was in the glass. All the lighting, which glasses to use, everything's really clean. Being clean is super important with food photography. Make sure your vessels are clean, your glasses are clean, your surface is clean, your hands are clean. Wash your hands all the time. Handle the glasses from the top. Don't no fingerprints, plates, immaculate. I with I use a lot of Windex and a lot a lot of bounty. Bounty are really nice paper towels because they don't leave lint. So I, that's all I ever use. And I use a lot, I do use a lot of Windex. And a clean, a pristine glass or plate makes all the difference. So you start with a clean, start with a clean set, a clean vessel. You make your decision about the surface first because it's the hardest thing to change later. Then you build and you put your you get your glasses in place. Then you decide if you want any other things such as these coasters or a napkin or a straw, all the things that are non-perishable and that can be moved easily. You make all those decisions first. So then you decide, do I want something in the background or is this fine as it is? And you might put a drink in there to look at first to see, oh, it's pink, okay. I mean, this, it looks essentially like this. Do I want some more things behind? So a person has a sense of place. Oh, we're at this fun restaurant and there's things going on and I want to be there. Or do you want to just show the food? So in this case, we decided this would be fun to make it look like it's a gathering. There's other people, which makes it more inviting. So we included drinks in the back and then the photographer, and this is not my strong point, but Amanda will speak to it, was able, and you can do this on a phone, to throw the back out of focus. So it's there, but you don't 
really look at it. You, you always want the person to look at the food and first, you don't want them looking at, oh, what's that yellow spot over there? You want, oh, I'm looking here and then I'm looking around. This is your hero and the hero, you wanna show off your hero the best way you can and then consider everything else. So we did all that. And then the very final thing that I did, of course I had a photographer too, but I, a person could do this on their own. The last thing you do is pour this drink and you then take the picture immediately while the bubbles are fresh. Cause that freshness and liveliness will make a shot. Drips, anything like that will make a shot. Um, okay, so this one, you can kind of see it's, you could do, you know, I think people love to see, people love behind the scenes shots. And I don't know why uh, restaurants can't, and I, I think quite a few do, include shots of the food being prepared. This isn't quite being prepared, but you can see there's a little bit of mess with the nut, with this knife, the spatula. So you could do things, well, this, you could do things in preparation mode. I wouldn't suggest doing them in the kitchen because of the lighting, but you could certainly set something up on a sheet pan or on a surface that looks like a work surface. It could be at uh, the bar, which I know at a lot of places, the bar is maybe near some light and the bar could look like a work surface. And you can show things in process, which people love to see that. It's also a really good way to show off what is in something. It's a good way to show off the beautiful ingredients you use or that you actually hand chop things that you're not buying. Maybe you, some, if there is something you, act, you do hand chop, maybe you buy cabbage in bags already chopped. If, but if you don't, showing it partially chopped, a little bit here and there, makes people feel that the food is personal made just for them, that someone really cares about it, um, that thought has been put into it, that it's nurturing and nourishing. And so that the experience of the preparation, I think is really important. As in, in addition to the experience of being in the location, particularly since right now, people are not in location so much. So it's an experience of care. I mean, we go to restaurants, it's hospitality. We want people to be hospitable to us and care for us. And so any way you can convey that, I think is really important and can make and be very impactful. So, um, plan, okay, we, maybe we should have started with this because I didn't plan it. I just started yakking away, but um, all right. Say you decide you're gonna take a picture of the sandwich. I'll, with this one, uh, first of all, I, I knew I had to make the sandwich. So I made sure I had all the ingredients that I needed. I made sure they looked good. I went through all the rolls and found nice ones. I mean, you may not, you, you, if you're at a restaurant and you have rolls, you, it's a good chance you've got dozens and dozens of them. So go through them. If you are looking at the sandwich like this straight on, don't look at the roll from the top, look at the roll from where you're gonna see it and pick one you really like. And it only has to look good on one side. Remember with food photography, people forget this. It only has to look good from one side. It's like, well, it's like an embalmer in a way. I mean, that's sort of disgusting, but it only has to look good from straight on. Nobody, it doesn't matter what's around the sides. So this roll, I picked it just, I don't know what's on the back and it doesn't matter. The same with the meat and everything else. So I, you get all your ingredients together, you keep them moist, you don't let them sit out. So I chose the meat, I had it covered and so on. We picked a background, we got all that straight. We put the roll on it, we made it look good. We decided about the lighting, you know, you move it around, make a fit, make an ugly one, just make any old sandwich or any old whatever it is, don't put any time into it and put it on the plate that you're gonna use or the background that you're gonna use, put it near a window, make yourself a stand in and say, oh my God, it looks horrible on this plate or it looks great on this plate, so that's settled or this window's not so good, but maybe that one or I really don't, I thought this blue surface was gonna look amazing with this orange, you know, this butternut squash soup and actually it doesn't, they clash or it makes the soup look like a big orange moon and I don't like that. So make all those, those decisions ahead and plan and be prepared because then when you start doing it, it'll go much faster, you'll be more, and you'll be more successful. So planning, yes, it's really key. Make, I make a lot of lists, uh, you know, I'm like totally addicted. To, I can't function without, without a list. And I, I make lists and I make them also in list of priority. And if you're gonna try to shoot a bunch of stuff at once, prioritize your list. Like 
okay, I have to have a photo of this, this doll or, but I don't really need a photo of this particular rice dish. It's great if I have time in my 30 minutes or whatever, but put it at the bottom. So you know what you have to do, focus on that and then let things drop off that are less critical or crucial, particularly if you've got another person coming in to help you or another one of your employees is gonna be a hand model for you and, and so on. And time is of course always of the essence. If I can, I would love to say too that, you know, aside from planning what you'll take a photo of, but how you'll actually frame it in your shot can be important. As small business people, you know, we don't have a ton of time to take a lot of photos. If you can take, take as many photos as you can, obviously, when, if, when you have the time. But if you don't, you know, you want to make sure that what you do take has the most uses possible for you. If you start with, say, the photo we see in the bottom left corner where it's nice and cropped for Instagram, then you can't use that as like a large web header on your website because that's a horizontal thing. Whereas if you start with a larger, just simple background, everything is in focus, the entire dish is in frame, and the background can be extended or cropped, then you can adjust that photo multiple ways. You see how this one photo can go from being great for a magazine spread then it can be a long horizontal web header and it can be cropped up nice and tight for an Instagram photo. So if you don't have a lot of time to take a lot of photos, take one photo that can be used multiple ways. That's a really good point. So turn your camera for one thing, you can shoot it horizontally and vertically. Also you can back, pull away and leave a lot of space around it. All the, not everything, but a lot of things we do, there's a lot of space so they can be cropped different ways. And the other thing you can do, this is a really good point, Amanda, is you could say you have this sandwich. I just did one, um, it was a black bean burger and we did the sandwich horizontally. So there was something next to it, like a little bowl of chips or something. So it worked that way. Then we took the, or a napkin. Then we took the chips out. We put a tall skinny glass behind it and shot it that way. So it also worked vertically. So that's a really, really good point is to think about multiple uses and not, you can either just shoot it different ways or you can add things, take things away and so on while keeping your food fresh. And the, um, I thought of one other thing that you said. Uh, I think that's a, that's a really, really good point. Um, oh, well, the other thing you said also, so you build it, you have it, it looks great from this side. There's no harm in looking at it from another angle. Once you look, you know, look around, might look great, shoot around because you can edit later. You got it already there. So look at, shoot it overhead. Look at it from the left, look at it from the right. That's a really, really good point. And look at it. And yeah, because you can always delete. So definitely, but that's, yes, important. With this one, you could have tilted the roll back, come up a little higher and tilted the roll back. And that might look super cool to see it from 45 degrees or maybe even higher. Or you could take the roll off completely and just see the top. So yeah, that's options is really smart. And planning ahead on that is a really good idea. So have some things on hand, like a napkin or a fork and a knife, just various things you might put in and out. Does that sound right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. good, right? Absolutely. Um, I think we kind of talked about this already. Mm -hmm. We did, and you mentioned that I could speak a little more to how to blur your background with your phone. I know a lot of us do not have professional photographers or even a professional camera. We're using our smartphones. And those phones have really great cameras and a lot of different modes. So I definitely recommend just playing with every mode and setting you can on your phone because some of them have very sophisticated um, technology in there. Even some of the like older models. I mean, I had a phone for 10 years and it still had a lot of settings I still didn't know about. Um, but yeah, I know Lisa mentioned earlier about making sure you get in close. Don't try to zoom in from far away. It can kind of make things a little grainy or blurry. Just get in real close to your subject. That will also help create some, some blur and distance on the focus. If you aren't able to just put up a poster board to create that nice simple background and you do have things in the background that you don't want to distract, then um, most phones call them portrait mode or selfie mode. They have a mode that will actually blur out that background. And the closer you are to your subject, the nice crisper lines you'll get around your main subject. I know I've been kind of far away from stuff before and used that mode. And it doesn't quite get all the edges quite right. The closer you are on your subject, the better those edges will be. And it will look like it's taken with a professional camera. The closer you, you want to add information, your phone is going to have for the details. So, and okay, so speaking of that, 
when you're gonna do close-in shots, do them first because that's gonna pick up everything. And then as the food is getting older, which food gets old extremely quickly and it shows really fast. So do the close ones first and then back up, not vice versa. Cause by the time you get close, the bread's dry, the cheese looks like plastic, the meat needs oiling, the lamp, et cetera. So that's a, also a really, really, really good idea. But you can see in this one, I'm sure this was cropped in a lot, but you could see that pulled back, there was probably, an, I know you could, this could be cropped different ways because you can see there's drinks, there's some beers back there, the chips go further to the left and so on. So there's that. And cropping of course is really how you crop makes a huge difference on how effective things are. So it's something to play around with. And don't forget to crop. Some people don't, I mean, many people don't think to crop at all, including me. And then you're like, oh, this would have been so much more effective if I just come in a little bit on the right and gotten rid of that distracting object in the back. Or maybe if I pulled, cropped it less and had a little space, it would have been more effective. And it would have shown off this food like, oh, there's a little air and I can, I can actually breathe And when I'm looking at this. So yeah, that's good. And this one, like this sandwich, I, I'm sure I always have a cup of oil and a little brush when I'm doing food and I'm sure I brushed the very edge of that bread. I, I can see on the um, crust there, it's a little, and I brushed the meat too. You don't want it greasy, but moisture really, really, it makes a tremendous difference. I look at so many things where the food just looks, it just looks old, it looks dry. And all it would have taken was some water on a brush or some oil on a brush and that would make, it makes all the difference in the world. That's sometimes pretty much all I do on my job is, apply some oil and they're like, oh, you're, that's so fantastic. And that's really all it was. So, yeah. Steven, you wanted to add something? I just wanna remind everybody, if you have any questions or comments, just please add them to the chat so we can address them later. That's oh, all. here's a question, I, um, the oil. So, I, okay, two things. I use just plain old, any kind of vegetable oil in a little cup with a little brush. Um, I put not very much oil in there because otherwise it gets up too high on the brush and it drips and you don't want it to drip on your set. Like we don't want oil drips on that paper. Sometimes you do, but not usually. And the other thing is I have a little squeeze bottle with a very, very fine tip. It's like, um, for it's a decorating bottle that they sell at craft places for cakes. It's a really fine tip and I keep oil in there and sometimes you keep olive oil in there and that's really nice for pasta, all kinds of things. Pasta, you'd be surprised how much oil you'd be surprised how much oil you can put on something and it doesn't look greasy. It, it's, you know, it just, it, it, I mean, you don't want it swimming, but it, you'd be surprised it, a, a lot. So I use it both ways. I use olive oil if I want it to show and have color. I use an extra virgin olive oil, especially on things like pasta or if it's pizza, like a drizzle of that at the end makes the whole thing come alive. It's like, oh, that was fine. Wow, that's great. And it's just that bit of shine because it picks up the light. And it gives it highlights, so it makes it look sparkly. And that sparkle really makes a difference on food. So, okay. Um, oh, this is this is Amanda. <laughs> this is another one. I mean, it's just both of us, Lisa. I do want to kind of let people know again when it comes to the settings on your phone, because mine was not turned on. Like the first one I had, I didn't realize you could overlay this grid. And I know Lisa, you can speak to why it's important to use this grid, but I do want to let you know that you do have it on most phones nowadays. If it has a camera, it most likely has this grid somewhere in its settings. It can be very useful for helping you lay out. So I did put here where you can find that. It's in the settings. And most Androids, you do need to open the camera app and go to the settings from there, not your main settings. In iPhone, you go to your main settings and find your camera settings there. So look for your grid. Um, mine actually has a couple options for grid. I have like a four by four, three by three, and something called a golden ratio, which I can let Lisa speak to in terms of composition and why these things work the way they do. But yeah. I didn't know about this grid and I've never used, <laughs> I've never used it. I see photographers use it. You know, I work so, and the golden, whatever you just said, I think that's the, I think, I think that's the thirds. And see, and I don't, I know what it is uh, naturally, but I haven't, didn't learn these things because I didn't go to art school, I went to cooking school. I, I went to art school, but it was for fabric. So I didn't do any of this, but I, you, maybe someone, maybe you should talk, the rule of thirds. Sure, maybe it is the rule of thirds. Um, it is the rule of thirds when you're laying out a lot of items in a composition. Um, a lot of times we want to put something dead in the center. And while that can be useful for certain things, it's not the most 
engaging and lively. It again kind of speaks to that concept of making things look flat if your lighting's not, you know, dynamic. Having these rule of thirds where you kind of put things on the point where your lines intersect. Um, it gives it much more flow and kind of liveliness. Um, Less expected, it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I didn't mean to go ahead. Now, I was going to say, I find it really helpful because I tend to just be like, I'm lining something up in the middle and I'm taking a photo. And then after looking at a while, then I have to crop and shift it over to make it look a little more dynamic. But using that grid to help you lay out things kind of in your corners together will help you create a nice, like, flowing composition that just gives a little more action so that it doesn't look quite as flat. That's a really good point. The, um, and I do this stuff automatically because I've been doing it for so long. So, um, and um, the, the little bit of surprise, like things not being in the expected spaces can, be, can make a huge difference in the impact of the photo. Like you don't want it to be so odd that it makes people uncomfortable, but slightly to the side. I agree with you completely. It makes people want to look rather than just their eyes go right past it because it's so um, typical. So yeah, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. We do have a question in the chat for you, Lisa, about managing kind of expectations for clients, um, people you're working with, because you mentioned earlier about having a whole team of people in there helping you take the photo can make things really take a long time. Oh, yeah. um, how do you kind of help manage those expectations and speed that along a little bit so you don't have a, like 10 people trying to kind of nitpick on every little thing? Right. Well, that's like about 95% of my job, honestly. Um, and it can be very, very trying and make things, it, it can, it's, it's hard. It's really hard. Um, there's obvious things like always be cheerful, always be positive, always be agreeable. These things I find difficult to always say, sure, no problem, sure, no problem. But then sometimes, but I also try to do some selling, honest selling, you know, like ethical, like I say, I mean, I am in the habit of when something comes up, I mean, I automatic, I'm like, wow, that looks great. I mean, I just do that. But people like it. If you lead with a criticism, it's, you know, automatically people get nervous. So if you automatically say, mm, nah, I don't like that line. It's so off-putting and demoralizing. But in this particular picture, but you said, wow, that's really great. Hmm, I'm not so sure about those forks, you know, that kind of thing. So that helps a lot with, with helping them feel more comfortable. And then Discussing things ahead of time is really important. Bringing people in, letting them, you know, talking it all over and listening to everybody and considering people have great ideas. And when they don't, when you don't like their idea, you might say, well, I take your point, but I, I see it differently. I don't push really hard, but if there's something I really like, I will say, well, I want you to be happy and definitely you're in charge or whatever, but I do really like this myself because a lot of it's very subjective. So I don't know, does that help? Let me see, let me read that question again. Um, prepping client, well, prepping clients, it's really, if, you, if you're if you working with a client, really important to have a shot list. It's really important to have a pre-pro meeting because you can work out a lot of this stuff ahead of time. Get on a Zoom and talk it over and make sure that you all, that your expectations are as closely aligned as possible and your priorities are as closely aligned and you know who's actually, also really helpful to know who has the final say. Because sometimes, no one you don't know and so it just goes around and around so you it helps to have someone say be the decider i you know ultimately um i think that's it and then and also like if you're doing certain foods it really helps to have like either the rest the recipe for the food if there exists such a thing or a list of what it is so you know that everything is going to be there and a game plan which things are most perishable and so on because you always want to work from least perishable to most who's bringing what maybe maybe um maybe the if there is a photographer or there maybe the um, restaurant owner has things at home they want to bring in to, to use for props all of that stuff is really helpful who's going to do what who's responsible for what the more clarity you have the better it's it's going to be, you know. Okay. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that definitely answers it for me. Definitely, it comes all comes back to the planning ahead as much as you can get done ahead of time yeah. when it comes to working with clients or with what you're going to take a photo of, etc. And um, I do want to kind of point out, I know we're focusing very heavily on food because that is Lisa's um, expertise, but a lot of these tips do translate to any photo you're going to take for your small business. 
even if it's of your staff doing things or if it's of a product that's not necessarily food, you still want to use that natural light. You still want to use these composition layouts. So I know it's very food focused. I know not everyone here is a food photographer or working with food, but I do hope that a lot of these tips can, can help translate for anything you're taking a photo of. And I do. I'm sorry. Well, oh, I had one. More. Well, the other thing is what people forget who are not, you know, clients or whomever, people who might be involved in a photo shoot, other, they forget that there's no eating involved here. There's no smelling, there's no tasting, there's only seeing. So I do do think, you know, I'm always trying to decide where is my ethical boundary and it moves. Like how much do I want to change this food from what it is, how it is actually done? Because people will say, well, we don't do it like that. And I say, okay, I get it. And I know you want it to look authentic, but you also want the people to be able to see what it is. You don't need to lay it all out in a grid, but you want them to, you do want it to look tasty. And if it doesn't look tasty the way you're doing it, then either don't take the picture or change it up so it does. Otherwise it's, there's no point, it's a waste. Mm -hmm. So sometimes things do have to be altered for the sake of the picture. And then you have to decide, is someone gonna get angry if it comes out to me looking like this? Or is it totally okay and it's subjective and they're not gonna care that the beans are on top of the rice or vice versa, you know, because it shows better. So I think for social media and things, you can definitely explain that in your captions. Like with the example we saw of like the burrito that was open and flat lay, obviously that's not how that's served. It's all rolled up and you can't see what's inside. And so if you're posting these to social media, you do have room for that caption. It can say, take a look inside our burritos or things like that that can help with that. Absolutely. That's great. Even, did you want to add something? That's a really good tip. I was just going to say, if you're applying this to other kinds of things, like taking pictures of your staff, please don't brush your staff in olive oil. That's all. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I had another thing. You know, whatever you're going to, you are going to shoot when you, like say you decide Tuesday, we're going to devote two hours to this or, ha or the morning or whatever. But ahead of time, take pictures of all the things that you plan to take pictures of and share them with everybody and get input and think about it. And if you're gonna have a meeting, it's so helpful to have pictures of what it is. So you can like, oh, we really like this part, but this, maybe not this, not so much. What can we do to make that better? It really helps to have just any kind of snapshot. So that's also really good. And you can scout, scout your location and your place. Take little pictures or all around ahead of time and see what works, what you like, what backgrounds are good, what aren't so effective and that kind of thing. This is like we do for Zoom calls, like what looks good behind us. So, yeah. So that is kind of it for our main tips and tricks we wanted to cover. But Lisa is going to take a second to review a couple photos that some of our restaurant people have submitted of their own that they would like feedback on. So feel free to, if you have a question if you're like, hey, I've taken a photo similar to that. What if I did X, Y, Z? Drop that in the chat and she will kind of give some feedback on some real photos that our restaurants have taken. And then after we do that, we will move into a more open Q&A kind of discussion for anything else. So let's take a look at what our local restaurants have submitted for us. And anybody, if you want to jump in, if this is your shot or whatever and you want to comment, okay, the one on the le left, here's, here are my comments about the one on the left. Um, it looks, it looks great. It looks delicious. It looks super interesting. You want to be there. The food looks yummy. The things I would do differently if it were up to me is I would move. I think I might get lower because I might make the background a little simpler. I might somehow move a little bit more to the left so that what's on the left, which I don't think it's a speed rack, but it looks like a speed rack. I might crop that out because the, the fire is really interesting. And then to the right of it, it's just kind of neutral. So that would be good. And the other thing is I would do something about the way the meat is interacting with that line because it looks, there's this weird optical illusion. Like is the meat cut off at the top? It looks straight. And that's super picky, but it does look, it confuses me. And I might come around a little bit more to the side because seeing into the side of ribs is really nice. And you can see into the one, but I'd love to see into the other one. And then I would also make sure to rough it up so you see the texture of the meat, which is what's really delicious about, you know, makes it enticing. I would oil it a little bit more. I might rearrange those pickles a little bit and I would definitely make them moist. And I might turn that roll a little bit so you see into the side of it. I might even break it, but it looks great. But those are the things I would do. And I might just loosen the whole thing up. There's this black thing on the back left side of the plate that I don't know what it is and it takes away and I would remove it so that you could just 
what you want to focus on is those two ribs, the biscuit and the pickle. That, the, that's the things we want to see. So think about those things. And if nothing else is anything else that's not like in service to those four items should be reconsidered in, in my opinion. There's a thing, I think it's a pickle on the left side of that one rib and I would take that off. So I don't know, is that helpful? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's the, Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. the plate's beautiful. I mean, you know, it's, it's great. The lighting's really nice. It's coming from the right side. It looks great. The one on the right, the food looks delicious. It's super interesting. It's a bold picture because there's like a lot of stuff going on, which is so much fun. And you know, it's different. It's not, you know, you're not at TGI Fridays, which is great. And, but it's, but it is really, really busy. I mean, I think everyone can see, so you kind of have a hard time knowing what's going on. And I'm not quite sure what the answer to that is, but a, a white background might help because a lot, a lot of yellow in there. So it might help. And also, okay, so on the left side, there's something white, a really quick fix to that. I think it, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's rice. I would move that to the other side. I would wrote, just spin the plate. So it's not in the light and you can see what it is and get some contrast. I think that would help. I think a simpler plate would be good. And I might just simplify the food a little bit. Like maybe I would put all the lettuce and the tomato together. So there's just not quite so much going on. I'm not, you know, things like that. I would do that. And then there's this square piece of, I think, banana leaf. There's one and then there's two. The one on top, I might pull it to the right and I might rotate it slightly because that straight line confuses me. Like what is going on here? Is that other thing cut off? There's this funny optical illusion. So I might do that. I might even pull it so that banana leaf broke the edge of the plate, which would really make you look at what's on it because it'd be like separated a little bit. Is that, are those helpful comments? Absolutely. Do you okay. think it's, it's helpful sometimes rather than trying to, like in both of these examples, rather than trying to photograph the full dish as it is, as it is served, like we talked about earlier, maybe if they had just had the rib, just had that one single focus, and then in the other case, just had the, I believe it's tofu and peppers, instead of having everything as it's served together, focus on the main portion of the dish. You can certainly have these as well. But in addition yeah. to that, having something that's a little more focused, do you think that would kind of help bring people in? Because that is the main portion of the dish. That could help a lot. Or sometimes what we do is like on the rib dish, the pickles could maybe be put in a little dish, even on the plate. So you get a little, so, I mean, I'm not saying it needs that, but it's an option. And maybe on the right, maybe the lettuce and tomato were, they could be a, maybe on a separate plate or together, like I said, or maybe the rice is in a little dish, just so it, just so you can see it and it just differentiates it. I would also turn these tomatoes, I would have, um, in speaking of planning ahead, if you're doing anything with tomatoes, plan ahead and buy your tomatoes like four days ahead of time so they get really red. And flip them over so you can see the skin. Mm -hmm. get That's that color. small, but it makes a big difference. And then I would put water on the lettuce and tomato at the end just so it looks like it's super fresh. You can do that with a, um, a little spritzer or if you use a little spritzer be sure to wipe up afterwards um or just a little just drip a little water on there but those are my suggestions i i okay. yeah that's yeah that's what i would say okay this one it looks delicious you really want to eat it but it's really hard to see what it is because the light's behind it so i know professional photographers use backlighting a lot for food but i don't know how to do that because even though i've done this forever and i should know about lighting i'm always so busy that i don't so this one somehow you need to get light on the front or side maybe it's octopus oh it's octopus in the front right i think so you need to get mm -hmm. lighting on the front of that or at least one side of it and it might even just involve rotating the plate and i can see the lights behind so the person whoever's taking the picture might have to squeeze into some weird corner to get the light coming onto the food and get the camera in front of it. And it, I think the whole thing could be loosened up a little bit so you could see what's going on because you're like, wow, that looks really interesting and yummy, but I can't quite see what's going on. So that's what I would say with that one. But like the closeness is nice and everything. Mm -hmm. And then in the background, there's that gray that I don't think that's necessary. I, just plain would be good. But the I do like the reflection on the... Um, table too i mean it's you know but yeah I, that's what i would say does anybody else have anything to add about that and it could be loosened like just maybe put together a little bit looser on the plate so you could see the parts a little bit more like this 
on the right, I don't know if that's, it's either a mandarin orange, I think it's a mandarin orange. It can mm -hmm. be moved a little bit away. And some of these peppers and things could maybe be falling off so you could see them, that kind of thing. But mostly this one, it's a question of lighting and getting the light on the hero, which is what's in the front. And just finding that by moving it around and looking at it. Um, this one, okay, so this was done outside and this one looks delicious. The cheese is freshly melted, which is great. The roll is really beautiful. You can see everything that's on it. Um, the background's busy. I would, I try not, personally, I try not to have car, you know, I try to get cars out of the shot if possible. I don't know if moving around would have helped that or not, but the out of focus background's great. But this one, you can see the lighting's real flat. So the food looks kind of dead. Like if there'd been, maybe it was an overcast day, but light coming from, coming, it just is kind of not, li the light's not lively. And honestly, Amanda, you can probably speak to that more than I can. I just know that's true, but I don't know that I know a solution for that. I think it's to the point we mentioned earlier about directional lighting, about having lighting coming from a particular, like, especially the side. The side is always kind of my favorite. If you have light from the front, it can be very flat. If you have light from the back, then what you're looking at in the front is very dark. The side lighting, um, putting your food just next to a window and windows over here, food is here, and you're taking the photo this way is honestly my favorite way to kind of handle and capture more dynamic lighting. I think it's, it's great that it's very bright. I think it's, I think it's great. If I would eat it. Absolutely. And you do it's capture delicious. that experience by being outside. Mm -hmm. But I think that the directional lighting would have helped this one just a little bit, really kind of make it pop and not look quite as flat. You might have been, they might have even been able to add a light on the left side. Is that right? I'm not sure. You know, the other thing I might do as a stylist is push everything that's on that bottom roll forward. Like put this as a unit, push the meat and the cheese and everything, just like give it a push. I might have pulled mm -hmm. some, I think it's chopped olives. I might have pulled some of that off and pushed everything forward so you've less bottom bun and a little bit more meat and cheese. But you know, it, it, yeah, it looks delicious. Yeah. We have one more I want to get to before we move into our Q and A before we get out of time. So this is our last one we're going to look at. This one, um, I think it's the same issue with this one. The light's very even, but it's very bright. And I would take out that big, I take out that big bean sprout in the front because it's blocking. And I just would like to see more. It looks like there, looks like there's a dumpling in there on the right. I just would like to see more. I feel like I'm straining. To see what's it. this might be better from overhead and maybe built just for this you know like you put each thing down one thing at a time and see that you can see it and i would put uh even though this is i'm sure the way it's served with the chopped a lot of chopped peanuts on top i would um, minimize that because no one's going to know it's not the right amount and it's covering like lots and lots of goodies underneath mm -hmm. I think this is a case for where we were talking about showing off the ingredients. Now, whether that's the dish in the middle, just as it is with some pieces of the ingredients off to the side and a little bit of a messiness prep look or showing it as it's being prepared, because if you're not familiar with this dish, you don't know what you're about to eat. And if you don't know what you're looking at, what kind of, you know, is it an onion? Is it a green bean? Is it, you know, peanuts? Then you don't, when you see something, you see a tomato, you know, it's a tomato, you start to taste the tomato. I think that's what you want to capture with your food photography, right? You want to make sure people know what they're looking at so that they can kind of imagine eating it. And that's what kind of makes them draw to it, right? Or even if they don't know what it is, they can see it and get curious. Mm -hmm. Like this one just can't, like maybe there's a shrimp in there that could have been put up, like that left corner up there next to the lime is a perfect spot to feature some delicious ingredient just to mm -hmm. bring it. And I don't know if anybody wants to do this or not. I work with dental forceps, which probably you don't, but moving food around with your fingers is difficult because fingers are big and fat and they get in the way. So there's no harm in having some kind of, I mean, a lot of chefs use those big tweezers. I don't they're because they're too big, but they would work. Any kind of a thing where you can move it around, it's really hard to do with you. Plus then your fingers get greasy and you're holding your phone. So you're constantly washing your hands, which is why people use stylus because the photographer wants to keep their hands clean. It's really nice to have two people because one person's got their hands in the food all the time. Absolutely. So, if you have yeah. extra hands, if you have an extra staff person or a friend who can help you out, it's always easier to do it with two people. Absolutely. Yeah, and you could have this one maybe would have been a good idea to have a person holding a fork, maybe lifting something out of it would have been a good way to show what was in there. That would have mm -hmm. been a possibility for this or something on a fork. That might have that might have been that could be effective for a dish that's complicated. 
Complicated dishes with lots of ingredients are challenging. They just are mm -hmm. challenging. They're challenging. They, I mean, it looks yummy, but yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, that is it but, for the actual presentation. Anything else you want to add, Lisa? And then we can open it up for some questions. No, I'm good. I would rather, I would, I'm happy to ask questions. I'm very I'm hungry having... for one. <laughs> okay. Pardon me? I said I'm very hungry after looking at all that food. Me too. And I haven't had breakfast. I know I'm hungry. <laughs> Yeah, we should have had a warning. You know, you're gonna be staring at food, so make sure you've eaten before you came. Because I'm, I'm in the same boat. I didn't get breakfast either, and now I'm regretting that choice. So, um, anyone, feel free to just jump in. There's a raise your hand function if you'd rather. If you want to kind of be up next while someone else is talking, otherwise, feel free to just unmute and ask Lisa anything you wanted to know. So I just have a um, a comment, and this is something that I'm just taking from the. The discussion, Lisa, is that um, the simpler the dish that you're taking a picture of, the easier it is to convey what it's about, um, and that to not be afraid to deconstruct a little bit from how you would normally serve it. And I think that that can be the, the hang up, right? Because you know, as a restaurateur, how you want to present your food in front of people. But when you're taking a picture of it, you need to kind of let go of some of that construction right. that you right. would normally put into it. That's right. And that's a mindset. And that's, yes, that's, that's the psychology of it where you have to really, really look at it. Look at it and think about what you want to show and let, exactly, let go of. You have to put on a bit, to use a cliche, you have to put on a different hat. I was very attached to how food was supposed to be for like the first 10 years of my styling. And when I let go of that, my job became so much easier. When I, it's a prop, it's become a prop. It's not a meal anymore. And you have to right. think about it that way. So yeah, we, yeah. yeah. And that, that helps a lot. And think about someone is only looking at this. They're never gonna be able to eat it or smell it or anything. They're just looking, what are they gonna see? And you have to really, Focus on your eyes, yeah, and the picture. Yeah, that's a really good point. We have a question in the chat. Um, have you been able to, Lisa, um, shoot Ruthie's all day or any other like Pike um, restaurants? Have you had any experience with specifically on the Pike? I haven't because most of those I've worked with. I worked with photographers that have shot at a lot of the places, but they don't. They, you know, stylists are um, not for you know. There's it's an extra expense. And so when they send when they send the photographers out for a restaurant stuff, there's 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 never a stylist in the budget. I did say I told you this already that I would be I would be more than happy. I would love to um, give time to do styling for um, Columbia Pike uh, businesses. It's just after COVID or any time. I said that when we talked earlier. Absolutely, I, I think it'd it would be great. I'd be very happy to do that because it's never in the budget. I don't get called for it. It's not like they call me. I say no. They just don't call me. So I used to a long time ago. I, so no, I haven't, but yeah. Yeah, I think once we can a little more safely gather and go visit other places and restaurants and businesses, Pico is definitely interested in having more hands-on kind of like in-person things going on where we could have a day where, you know, this is available, schedule, you know, an hour with her to come to your restaurant. And we kind of have you actually go out and take some photos. Cause I know at Pico, we're always trying to promote um, promote our local restaurants and things. And there are some times where, you know, we get a photo and it doesn't quite work in the horizontal layout we're looking for. So I know it, selfishly, Cipro would love to be able to get more, you know, great use out of some photos for our restaurants and things. So absolutely, once we're able to more safely gather and logistically work that out, we would love to do that. Would that be Even? Great. Yeah. I'm also really interested in uh, somehow fostering a connection between Lisa and La Cocina. Um, well, me too. Yeah, I, would I love I, that. I haven't figured it out, but I would really, really like it. I'm very, I'm super interested in that place. And yes, I just don't know what to do. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Because they, know you know, they have their ghost kitchen concept and they have all kinds of different restaurants working out of there that they connect with. So yeah, that'd be a great connection. Yeah, you can definitely make that connection. I've done a lot of styling for restaurants that are similar, like I've done for um, very uh, like Moby Dick's and California tortilla, which is, is local, you know, and was mentioned there. And I, I forget, I can't remember, but lots and lots and lots and lots. So I certainly am capable of doing those things. And I also really enjoy it. 
And for the po the post, they bring in stuff. They t they bring in take out food and have me deconstruct it and reconstruct it. It's really really fun. I've done a bunch of lots of pizza places. Um, I, I honestly, my brain is I can't remember anything any of the places right now. But the um, I love doing stuff like that. It's it's really fun. To, I think it's really fun to take a food that's challenging and isn't inherently um, um, photogenic and make it look good. That's a lot of fun. So yeah, I'd love to do that. Okay, does anyone have any other questions? Is anyone, oh, in addition to lighting, what would be your top tip for the daily special shots that may not lend themselves to a bunch of advanced? So if so, the restaurant's trying to kind of say, this is our daily special today, they've most likely already prepared the dish and whatnot, what kind of advice would you give for those kind of photos that need to be taken very quickly on the spot without a lot of prep? Um, Find the, look, look for the best angle for the food. Make sure it's moist and fresh and hot. If there's any cheese involved, don't melt it until you're right, ready, about to shoot it. And then mm -hmm. keep it moist, you know, I'd say keep it moist and find the best angle. Find the, look at it and say, I mean, that's really basic, but it's surprising, you know, people forget. We've all seen this stuff on Instagram. Mm -hmm. yeah. You take one photo, you're like, that's good. And you don't kind of keep going and trying the other angles. Because while it may be good, there might be something better. Absolutely. Yep. 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 Lisa, I know you said not to uh, try, try your best not to take photos at night, but um, or in the dark. What if, if if it's necessary and that's when the shot is and what what, what are tips to, to try to, uh, you know, to do the best you can with what uh, it, when it's darker outside? I think those might be iPhone questions. I'm not sure because I've never really gotten very good at that. Still directional lighting, soft lighting. You know, I do a lot of stuff. Yeah, well, you don't need to hear what I do, but the but it, when it's in a restaurant at night, I guess build the food so it works best to one side and then light it from that side somehow with a soft light. I mean, you can do stuff with just lamps and things, I believe, Amanda, right? By setting Absolutely. them to one side, just not overhead and not the flash on the camera. Yeah, I know, Matt, you're at Ruthie's. I know that, you know, when you're at your restaurant at night, all the lights are on overhead, but sometimes even going outside and maybe putting it next to, I know you guys have those nice tall kind of heaters that oh, look a little bit yeah. like flames. That might give you some directional lighting. And then I know um, Good idea. phones these days do have something they call night mode or dark mode, which will actually like take the picture for a long time and let in a lot more light. Um, oh, that cool. might be something to do, but you do have to make sure you're very steady with it, either a tripod or like setting your phone like down on a surface and holding it really steady. And then you can use that night mode on your phone will really kind of let in a lot more light. Um, but yeah, I would say any way to get directional light rather than overhead it, when it's dark is going to be extra like important. Yeah. And also you could do some experimenting around the restaurant and see which area is most conducive to you know, pretty food at night. Like maybe one corner of the bar where there's light coming from one side. I'm not sure. Those are camera. Those phone ideas are really good. That's not my. Yeah, yeah. But that's those are good ideas. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? It's hey, well, wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad everybody joined us. Um, yeah. If Anybody, if they want to get in touch with me, I'm more than happy to answer questions, help out, you know, I'm, anytime anybody wants to call me or text me or email me about anything, I'm really all about, you know, small business and community, and I would love to contribute because I don't get enough opportunity to do that, so I'd love to be included. We did record this, so we will put this recording up, and we will also kind of put the presentation up in like a PDF where you can just print that off if you'd like. So you have it there as like a cheat sheet as a reminder. And we can definitely include Lisa's contact information. And again, thank you so much, Lisa, for joining us. Even you want to kind of wrap it up? Welcome. I hope it was helpful. Very much so. Thanks for including me. Okay. Lisa. okay. Thank you. Well, wow, it was super helpful. Very uh, fascinating to get her eye. I Again, every time I look at the food section of the post, her name is all over it. It's so great to see. Um, a Pike resident kind of give back to the community. So that's awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. We're very, very proud to have her as a neighbor. Okay, well, if nobody has anything else, it's been a great morning. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you next time.